Okay, so today I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the changes that are happening to the way that we're displaying the measurements that we do. Headphone measurements can be tricky to understand. There are, of course, those who will look at headphone measurements and say, that doesn't tell the whole story. And then there are also those who love measurements, but will frequently overfocus on the minutiae that doesn't really matter or even correspond to what would be their own experience in the first place. And this is a problem. This is a problem with how people approach headphone measurements. It's a problem with how we read this stuff. In fact, even many of us who spend a lot of time looking at headphone measurements uh, will often make, you know, various different errors in terms of reading them. And that's not necessarily the fault of the reader. It's often the fault of how the measurements are represented. And it doesn't have to be like that. There is a better way to do this. And I'm hopeful that this is a start. It's a step towards that direction. So let me give a brief overview of what we're doing here. And I'm going to show you some examples of the measurements and how we're representing them. So let me begin by showing you guys what we're doing here for headphone data visualization moving forward. Here you can see a headphone measurement. This is the same measurement as this and the same as this and this. So what am I showing you here? Well, the line you see here is the frequency response of the headphone compensated to the diffuse field head related transfer function of the measurement rig that the measurement was taken on. So this is effectively compensated against flat DF, not tilted DF. That's what you may have seen before in some of the videos that we've done leading up until now. And the main reason for that is because we were working on this. This wasn't ready at the time, so we didn't have that ready to go, but now we do. So with this measurement, you can see that we're instead showing the preference element, which is the shaded area here, and that's the approximately 10 decibel slope that most people prefer in headphones and in speakers. We're showing that here as preference boundaries. So we can basically think of the information within the shaded area as falling within the bounds of what most people prefer. Now, where do these boundaries come from? Well, this is essentially from the Harman research. And this raises the question, well, why not just show it relative to Harman? And we actually have done that in the past. But as we know, there are issues with doing that. Even if you consider the most commonly used outcome of the 2018 research, which is the Harman curve that, you know, everybody sort of knows and loves, individual preference still falls within a range. And one of the most common mistakes that we see people make when they're reading headphone measurements is they will interpret this as being the one true target. And that was never the intention of the Harman research in the first place. In fact, the whole reason why the research exists is because people have different preferences. And so showing it with these preference boundaries makes a lot of sense. By using preference boundaries, we can show both the largest segment and still account for individual preferences within that range. So effectively what you get here is the frequency response that is calibrated to the ear transfer function of the measurement rig, and then in the same graph shown relative to the preference window where most people fall. Now, you may be familiar with some of the measurements that we've shown in the past relative to a tilted line, the 10 dB line there. Think of this as the more sophisticated version of that. So the 10 decibel slope is still here, it's just showing a range rather than a static line. So the bottom line is that this new way of representing the data solves the problem of people approaching headphone measurements thinking that the Harman target or any target is a is meant to be a one size fits all target. You know, people will read it as a one size fits all indication of how headphone tunings should be. And that's never been the intention of the research. Now, I know there's also some folks out there who hate the fact that we're using compensated measurements. And I promise you, it is better this way. <laughs> it is better to show it as compensated rather than raw. So why is that? Why is compensated better than raw? And I myself, in the past would have preferred raw as well, but I've since come around on this. I've, I've learned the error of my ways and understand now that compensated is definitely the way to go. The biggest reason for that is when you're actually reading headphone measurements, it is so common to make mistakes when reading parallel lines, when looking at parallel lines. Uh, so this is something called the sign illusion. And here I'm showing you kind of what's going on with that. You can see it's really easy to make this error when you have two lines kind of, you know, horizontally going next to each other to understand where the actual distance is between those two lines. So even if you did want to show frequency response relative to a target, the sign illusion in a raw graph kind of messes up the interpretation of that. People make this mistake all the time. In fact, I was even recently reading a thread online somewhere where someone was like, whoa, the compensated measurements don't match the raw ones. It's like, but actually they do. It's just that the sign illusion makes it so it's difficult to understand the raw measurement the way that it actually is. <laughs> now, the second reason to use compensated rather than raw graphs is this allows us to compare headphone measurements across 
different rigs, albeit imperfectly. So we can take a headphone, put it on a measurement rig, do a measurement, and then compensate it to that rig's head-related transfer function. Then we can take that same headphone, put it on another rig, and compensate it to that rig's head-related transfer function. And while this is imperfect because the headphone transfer function also has an effect, we've talked about this at length in the past, they are at least still somewhat comparable. In fact, there is very interesting data that arises as a result of any differences that you find among rigs, because we should think of these as different heads as well. So there are, of course, differences for head-related transfer functions, but there are also differences for how the behavior of a headphone changes depending on the head that it's on, and you can see this when you are compensating to diffuse field head-related transfer function across different rigs. Now, another question that comes up is why diffuse field? And I think there's probably even some folks who think that... Uh, you know, diffuse field has been sort of debunked as a target curve by, you know, the Harmon research. And that's true. People don't actually prefer flat diffuse field. And so that's why it's not being represented as a target curve. Imagine that a headphone perfectly matched to diffuse field, that would look like a flat line across, and that would technically be outside the bounds of the shaded area because nobody really likes that, or very few people like that. If you like that, you should feel shame. No, I'm just kidding. However, diffuse field is a well-defined sound field. And importantly, it can be replicated without needing the same listening room or speakers for any given test fixture. And there is a whole method to that. We're not going to get into that in this video, but there, there's a way to do that. Diffuse field also has strong theoretical justification to be used as a baseline for a headphone reference target. Since conventional stereo recordings can't be consistently localized with headphones. You wear headphones on your head, they are not like speakers at a distance. And lastly, there are very small differences between the in-room baseline for the Harman target and the diffuse field head-related transfer function of the Kimar mannequin whose ear is used in the Harman work, meaning that diffuse field can be considered a comparable starting point to Harman's work. So once again, just to reiterate and to be very clear about this, this is not being compensated to diffuse field with a tilt. This is being compensated directly to the flat diffuse field head-related transfer function of the measurement rig, of the mannequin head. And then that is being shown relative to preference boundaries for where most people like their headphones to sound. And this is being shown as a range rather than just a singular line because the point here is to demystify the idea or the false notion that there is this one true curve or there is one singular target curve that everybody should like their headphones to sound because if anybody's telling you that, that's just false. You can effectively think of this as microphone calibration for the frequency response in headphones and then that being represented against a preference window that we know from the Harman research. So I know that a lot of this is super complicated and confusing stuff and I'm sure we will need to do more videos on this topic, but I want you guys to leave here with a few key takeaways. The first is that comparing two raw plots against one another or a raw plot against a target is inferior to showing compensated plots because of visual illusions. Number two is that comparing two different headphones across different heads or rigs with raw measurements isn't possible to do, but people do that anyways. So we're trying to fix that with this. Number three is that preference research is something that is going to continue to be done as it should be. And when changes happen, and we just learned that there's gonna be even more preference research coming out soon, when changes happen, we need to figure out a way to make sure that the old data is still compatible with the new data. And this is also a way to do that. All we have to do is make adjustments to the preference boundaries, for example, and then and then it's compatible. And unfortunately, you can't update screenshots that have been done in the past. Um, and so we're using here a database that allows us to do this. Number four, and this is probably the most important one, is that showing a headphone measurement relative to a single line or compensating to that line always, by necessity, leaves out groups that have been established to have different preferences. And if you want references for that, I will leave that in the description. But just as an example, the Harmon segmentation paper explains this quite well. This is a paper that actually isn't focused on enough in my mind. And lastly, this new measurement visualization is an attempt to solve all the problems mentioned in this video when it comes to how people by default approach headphone measurements. Or at least it's an attempt to improve the state of affairs with headphone measurements right now with the standard of showing data that can incorporate a range of preferences, a standard for compensation or calibration that doesn't need to be revised based on new preference research that gets done, and importantly is compatible across different measurement systems. If you find any of this as confusing as I I imagine it will be. Our resident science enthusiast Blaine is currently putting together an article that'll be up on headphones.com once it's ready. So if you're curious about what this is and why, definitely check that out. But also uh, definitely join us on our Discord where we are you know, currently still discussing various different things. And this is where all of us headphone measurement nerds gather to talk about this kind of stuff. So join us there. It's a fun place, I promise. <laughs> all right, that is it for now. I'll see you guys in the next video.